Thank you, and thank you so much, Malcolm. Uh, thank you, Chris, and all of the team for uh, taking this risk to let me loose among you here, a poor Anglican. But it's just uh, wonderful uh, to be here. Thank you so much for turning out to talk about sex after lunch, which <laughs> doesn't always go together, does it? Well, <laughs> um, sex has always been a, a difficult issue, hasn't it, for we Christians to talk about. Um, I often tell the story when I was a little boy, aged about nine, if you can imagine me, thinking that I'd try out a word I'd heard on the radio on my grandmother. And I said to her, Granny, what does the word pregnant mean? Okay, we're talking the mid-50s here, a long time ago. What does the word pregnant mean? And do you know what, what she said? She thought, and she said, I don't know. I don't know, you see? But I knew she'd had two children. And, and yet I could see with, with, the, um, with, with the look in her eye as she averted them, the slight look of shame that, that uh, this, was, this was hard for her. And that little incident is a window into the journey that many of us here had into this experience of being made sexual in the image of God. A journey that for us as children and as young people has been shrouded in fear and in shame and in ignorance. And as our body explodes at age 13, 14, we, we, we get a good idea of what we're against, but what are we for? And what is this for? The Catholic theologian Christopher West says, if teaching about sex in our churches were a food, most of us have been brought up on the starvation diet. He's right, isn't he? Now, let's leave this little chap standing here for a moment because we're still in the mid-50s and we're going to cross over the Atlantic and there's a slightly older guy over there and he is about to launch one of the, the world's first ever mass market girly magazine. And it was called Playboy. And the man I'm talking about was Hugh Hefner. And looking back over those days in the 50s, Hugh Hefner recently, in an interview he gave, said one of the motivations for launching that magazine was, quote, a reaction to the fear and hypocrisy of my Methodist religious upbringing. Well, enough of fast, enough of starvation diet, people like Hefner was saying. From now on, it's going to be fast food. And tell me, friends, if the human spirit, the little 13 year old boy whose body is exploding, is given an opportunity to choose between a starvation diet. The fast food diet, a Big Mac. What is he and she, we, going to choose? So a revolution was born, driven by activists like Hugh Hefner. A huge social revolution. One of the, one of the most powerful social revolutions of recent times. Far-reaching effects. And it is driven by a simple overarching narrative of freedom, liberation, freedom from starvation and from shame and oppression and religious shame and the stuff that people like you and I put on each other and on our young people as we deny this side of who we are. And as this revolution began to gather speed and momentum, we, we found freedom in so many areas. We, we'll look in the early 60s here, slide, as the divorce rate slide begin to rocket. No, slide, slide, please, slide. No, okay, go back. 
What we found out, we had a few problems with the slides, I'm afraid, one of which is this doesn't work, and the other is that the build that I had on the PowerPoint doesn't work. So we tried to change them, but they're not there. So let me just tell you, forget the slides about divorce. From the 60s to about the early 80s, the, the rates of divorce rocketed sixfold as we freed ourselves from the promises we had made. And a few years later, the number of people getting married begins to fall, and it falls, and marriage itself in our society enters a deep and prolonged recession, especially among the poor as we freed ourselves from the commitments we might make. And with the arrival of gay marriage, we freed ourselves from authority and tradition, and we get to make the rules. We set the boundaries. We say who's in and who's out. And then eventually we freed ourselves from nature herself in transgender. We say what sex is. We make the rules. And the attraction of this, this grand narrative of freedom is it's just so simple and graspable. And the reality we have to face, friends, gathered in here is that most people out there, huge numbers of people out there, either don't think about this reality or they don't care or they think good riddance. And the reality we face is that just over a few decades, centuries-old convictions about what it means to live a good life, about sex and marriage, Christian convictions deeply woven into our culture, in just a few decades, these effectively collapsed. And now who are we? Where do we fit? And I don't know about you, I... I find myself looking at this huge revolution, wondering, what is the secret? It's power. What's it on? And you know the, the political theorist, Joseph Nye, he talked about two types of power, hard power, soft power. Hard power is getting what you want through coercion, so you send in the troops. And there's plenty of hard power amongst the activists of this revolution. You fall into the sights and you will feel the pain. And often Christians, because of that, have focused on the hard power and we gear ourselves up and we get out the lawyers. But I think that may have distracted us from what may well be the real secret of this revolution's strength, which isn't hard power, it's soft power. Nye said slide soft power is the ability to get what you want using attraction attraction it's what made it so attractive to the human spirit and I think that this soft power probably had three forms the power of the power of ideas this revolution had some great new ideas. The power of ideals, that is, a moral vision. And the power of story. Let's look at each of those in turn. The power of ideas. Martin Luther said, if you want to change the world, pick up a pen and write. And of course he did, and we're here because of the power of ideas. Ideas. And this revolution came along with some new ideas about how to answer one of the most fundamental questions we shall ever ask. Who am I? How do I, how do I find the answer to, to that question? Well, the revolution came along and supplied the answer. It said, you look inside yourself for who you are. You delve deep, you look within, you cast off the traditions and the authorities and the straitjacketing rules of the past, and you find your freedom within, and then you live authentically with the truth that you find there. We call this expressive individualism, the power of ideas, expressive 
next slide, individualism. Have you heard the term expressive individualism? It, it's a term coined by um, Robert Bella, sociologist, one of the, the very well-known uh, sociologists of, of the uh, 20th century. And in the mid-80s, he wrote a book called Habits of the Heart. And the subject of that book was the emergence of what he came to call expressive individualism. Now, what did he mean by that? Well, in, in his survey of history through the lens of a sociologist, Bella looked at the American dream and he noticed how the American dream was almost characterized by the notion of self-reliance, you see? And he called this utilitarian individualism. Why? Because you relied upon yourself to make something of the world and of your family and of your life, you see? But then over time, Bella observes utilitarian individualism in which you make something of the world gave way under the influence of therapy culture and the new psychologists to an even higher call which is to rely on yourself to make something of yourself. My chains fell off, my heart was free, I rose, went forth and followed me, me. And so the cultivation of, of me becomes our highest calling. Be yourself, just, just be real. It's everywhere around us, this thinking. And as a result, the term I identify as. Have you heard that? I, I, it's become one of the defining slogans of our age. I say. So it had great ideas. And then it had, a, in addition to this, a slide moral vision. It had ideals. And I think this is perhaps what caught traditionalist Christians, biblical Christians, off guard more than anything else. You see, morals, morals, that's our territory, isn't it? Where's the moral high ground? Around here, let's get up on it. And standing on the, the moral high ground for, for centuries, we have been used, because we've been in the mainstream of our culture largely, certainly in Western culture, we felt able to call out the evils around us of pornography and sleeping around and all of the other sins of the flesh. So when the revolution came along, it was business as usual. Call it out. But far from, far from unveiling a Dantean nightmare of debauchery, this, this vision cast a moral, this, this revolution cast a moral vision of being honest, being real, just being authentic, being true. And it cast them, you, as the little people, the bigots, the hate-filled, the ones who want to straight-jacket the people who don't fit your little rules once again. And for the first time in forever, how long, Christians in this country are getting used to the idea that, that, that in our culture it is they who are seen as the immoral. Forget moral majority. This is the immoral minority. And it, we don't like that feeling, do we? And so what we have to understand is that expressive individualism, the way it's unpacked in our culture, comes, next slide, freighted with, with virtue. The virtues of freedom and so uh, virtues that give way to freedom and flourishing and fairness. In the, in the standard Aristotelian sense of that word virtue, if, 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 if that means anything to you, it's a kind of goodness that leads to flourishing. I mean, look at the... Think about, think about a gay pride march. You know those great 
occasions when they march past our church doors that are bolted, and double bolted from the inside. Think about some of the images that you might see there. And again, it's business as usual. When we're confronted with images of, of sexual fluidity like this, we, we, we call it out and we say, have you heard about the rates of STDs and AIDS? And we give lists and facts in response to this. But friends, what we have to realize is that our culture is so changing so quickly that images like this do not convey those sorts of notions to people anymore. In their view, pictures like this portray moral purpose. They say, you continue with your shame culture where you can't even tell your children. You continue with your history of abuse in your churches where you cover up and you put on the side. You continue not preaching about this topic or bring it into the mainstream of your church but always pushing it to the edge hoping somehow it will go away whilst your pastors have affairs and your leaders you continue in that culture of hypocrisy and this though is who we are and you may not like it but at least it's real you feel the strength of this it's moral claim and this is everywhere around us and if you take expressive individualism, some great ideas, and then stir them in with, with a moral vision, and you have got a, a revolution on your hands. And friends, this is the story we live in, this story of a jailbreak, a bid for freedom, a getting out from under the dead hand of oppression. And talking about that, that this is our third strength, soft power of the revolution, the power of, of stories, you take that simple overarching story and, and retell it in lots of, of small stories with attractive characters, will and grace, friends. <laughs> they make us laugh and, and then... And then tragic stories like the Magdalene sisters and, and Brokeback Mountain and the, the imitation game. And they make us cry. And when they draw in our emotions, they open us up to their ideas. And the power of story is at, is at work in, in our culture and we swim in this story. It is everywhere around us. Our children are brought up on it. Every Disney movie. Well, what about this one? I forced myself to listen to, <laughs> to one of its main songs. What is it? Let it go. It's sung by a character determined no longer to be the good girl that her family and society had wanted her to be. Instead, she would let go let it go and express what she'd been holding back there is no no right or wrong no rules for me this, this is more than an awareness of the self we all think it's a good thing to be aware of one this is an enthronement of the self and in the words of Madonna it comes down our earphones as well slide Slide, yes, I am my own experiment. I am my own work of art. What not to like about that? Inspiring stories of freedom. And how did traditionalist Christians respond to this great story, to these wonderful, moving stories? With facts, with rules, with silence with fear and when our leaders do eventually feel compelled the bishops of the church of England for example as a body to say something about what their true convictions are about marriage the thing that they issue reads more like the terms and conditions of a software upgrade 
than a manifesto for human flourishing that we believe is a gift of God for the life of the world, doesn't it? But as the Canadian philosopher Charles Taylor says, you can't respond to a great story with facts. You have to tell a different story. Now return to this picture of this little boy raised in a classic Christian home and church for a moment. He's still here, by the way. Today, he is immersed in this culture. He swims in this story. It is the story slide he lives in and has his being in. It's your granddaughter. It's your son. It's your heart. And what he's asking as he looks out at us, he's saying, look, I've got, I do have a good idea of what I'm against as a Christian. But will someone tell me what I'm for? How am I feeling right now? How are you feeling right now? If I'm, if I'm doing this as a, something like this as a seminar, I often break now and I just get one word. Confused, overwhelmed comes up. Overwhelmed, depressed. Someone said, Pastor, put his hand up. He said, Well, I'll tell you what I'm feeling. I'm feeling I hope what's coming next is good. <laughs> I really hope it's good because I think this is what I believe. But I've never let myself think it, but I felt the power of it, and I don't know how to respond to this story around me, this story that we live in. Slide, please. Well, look, just thinking, let's just take a moment to think about this story I've, I've just told. And I want you to notice one thing, how simple it is. What a simple story it is. In fact, it is simplistic. If you're interested in the world and in cultural analysis, you're sitting here, I hope, thinking it's far more complicated than that, Hugh Hefner. Far more co If you want to understand how this great social and cultural revolution began to unfold into our culture, you've got to understand far more than this simple story of freedom. Well, if you're an economist, you'd say the post-war boom, the prosperity, put money into the pockets of, of women who'd been dependent on their husbands and were now finding freedom and emancipation in the workplace as they earned their own living, and they got themselves out from under the dead hand of their husband's oppression. So divorce rates went up, and as we became more economically well-off, we became more socially mobile, and that put strains on the old social ties. It's far more complicated than Hugh Hefner. And I, we'd say yes to that, wouldn't we? Good point. And if you're a philosopher sitting here interested in the history of ideas, you'd say, goodness me, this is so simple. It's far more complicated. In fact, the notion of expressive individualism has been recurring throughout history, the last time probably in the, in the mid 19th century, the inner light, the new romantics, Rousseau, Delacroix, with their search for the deep interior. And then before that, the ancient Gnostics with their hatred of the body and their quest for the freedom of the spirit, Christianity's greatest heretical opponent. And so we could go on. So we've got history of ideas, far more complicated. And if you're a a public health physician here, you're thinking, well, yeah, we'll listen to the philosopher a bit, and yes, the economist has some good points, and we need it's multifactorial, but I'll tell you in three words what drove this sexual revolution, says your public health physician. The first word is the, and the next word is what? Contraceptive pill, because at a stroke we uncouple sex from its consequences and whoosh. So it's far more complicated. But you see, that, that's my point. 
the secret of the power of this revolution is the simplicity of its popular cultural narrative. The people out there, friends, they don't know about Delacroix and Gnosticism. They don't know about economics and they're not so interested in what a public health is. But what they do all know is that you've just got to be yourself. That's the story that's captured the hearts and that is the story we live in, expressive individualism. And brothers and sisters, as, as we return to this chap here or your granddaughter or, or your daughter or you, what are, we, what are we for? It's time to make up our minds what we're for. And it's time to make up our minds and ask, do we too have a life-giving story in this area? It's time, again, for our congregations to have shepherds who will stop ducking these issues and hoping they'll go away because they won't. And this culture is after their hearts. And it's time that the sheep had shepherds for their hearts. And it's time for this chap, this young girl, this woman, this man, to discover not only what he's against, but what he is for. So, what is our story? I scratch my head about this, and, you know, as I, as I, as I thought about it, I came to see that our story, I think, begins in the same place as their story, this story. It begins with the big question of slide, identity. Who are we? The question of identity is the issue. It is the point at which the gospel story converges with their story. And it is the point at which the gospel story departs radically from it tell another one their story says to find out who you are you look inside yourself you are your own work of art our story says we did that we tried that we're, we're with you that's our starting point we looked inside ourselves and we found Confusion. We didn't find answers, we found questions. And we found insecurity and we found self-doubt. And we found fear. And we found wickedness and greed. And we found motivations and desires in our heart, a shadow which has its roots in hell, if we're honest. And you say that I build the foundation of my identity on that? Well, that is not my story. Because when I looked within besides those things, I found another part of me which cried out to the stars and said, will somebody out there name me and tell me who I am? Their story offers expressive individualism. Our story, slide, offers the image of God. And everything about the difference between that story and our story stems from that. Who we are as disciples of Christ. So we look within, yes, and, and yes, as we look within, we find images of greatness, don't we? I hope you find some images of great, some seeds of greatness inside. You're made in the image of God himself. Your desire to bring order to his world, to create, to bring beauty, to bring flourishing is born of the image of God that we bear. And we find seeds of destructiveness and lies and meanness and greed too. And we have to turn back in our story to our culture and say, you, 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 this is about authenticity, right? 
You tell me to be real about myself. Well, this is my reality. This is who I am. I'm greedy and I'm mean and I'm self-serving at times. And I will never build my identity on that because I have found another way, a better story. Because you see, it isn't so much that, that God, not so much that I found God in our story, it's that he found us. It wasn't so much that, that, that we drew him into our story as he drew us into his story. A story which tells us how he came after those who had so hopelessly tried to go their own way. Do you remember in, in Eden from the serpent, you shall be as gods. You shall be as gods. Your own work of art. We tried it. A story in which this God came to rescue those who tried it and spoiled and destroyed this world and themselves. A God who on a cross came to restore his image in humans which have become so broken and spoiled. And now our story is that we're learning to live once again in harmony with our design, with who we truly are in the image of God as he continues his work of restoration in us by his spirit. And so you see in our story, slide, identity, back one, identity, back one. Identity is not something discovered in the self or constructed by the self. For us, our identity is a gift to the self it is spoken by God and you know in John 1 it says that the word became flesh and dwell among us to reveal to us who he is but it also tells us that the word became flesh to reveal to us who we are to all who believed in him he gave the right to become children of God bearing the image of his own son Jesus this is our story this is who we are and now it's time to stand up and, and be counted and you say well okay I'm with you so far but what has this got to do with my deepest desires the ache for intimacy pleasure the union that I feel in the pit of my stomach, in my whole body, desire, pleasure, intimacy, the image of God. Well, if you want to find out what it has to do with the image of God, you need to look at the one in whose image you are made. What do we know about him? Two, two great truths as we open our Bibles and we begin to turn the pages first. He is, he is a creative ruler. And so we've already touched on this. We, made in his image, are creative. We send rockets to Mars. We sink submarines. We, we produce the most beautiful jewelry. We dance across a stage and bring an audience to their, as they see the image of God in all its beauty set forth in humans. So he's like that, we're like that. We rule, we create beauty. But then as, as we turn the pages of our Bibles, a second great truth emerges about the God who we serve. He is a ruler He's a great king, but also he is slide, a lover, a lover. And there are three aspects to, to his love as we carry on reading in our Bibles. Next slide. We, we, we discover that his love is passionate, it's faithful, and it's fruitful. Do you want to hear more? Passionate. 
The metaphor that's used over and over again as the pages of our Bible begin to rustle is the love of a bridegroom for his bride. Look at Isaiah 62, 5. For your maker is your husband. And this kind of, we're used to this. It rolls off the tongue. Do you understand what it is for the God of the worlds, the master of the universe, to say, your maker is your husband. I want you. Not just sign some contract with me. You know, it's not, it's not about going, going after the service to sign the documents. It's not about that. I want you, my bride. Passion of his love, the love that comes after us as a bridegroom rejoices over his bride. So I rejoice over you. This is the heart of our Lord in whose image we're made. And you want to love because he loves passionately and seeks union with his people. But the second thing about his love is it's passionate. The second thing is it, it's always faithful. And so continuing, Bible's rustling again with the metaphor of husband and wife. The prophets characterized Israel's idolatry as what? Adultery. Look at Jeremiah 3.20. If we can have that. But like a woman unfaithful to her husband, so you, Israel, have been unfaithful to me, declared the Lord. He is faithful. His love is always a for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, bound to his people in self-giving sacrifice. And this faithful, committed, one flesh picture of God's love for his people threads its way into the New Testament. And so in John, as the greatest of the prophets sees the arrival of the Messiah, what is one of the earliest titles used of Jesus that falls from the lips of John? Bridegroom. The bridegroom has come for his bride to give himself on a cross, to pour himself out for her. And when Paul is talking about the one flesh union of the marriage bed in Ephesians 5, he too connects the gospel with this theme. Next slide, what does he say? This mystery is profound, referring to the one fleshness of the marital union. He says, now I'm saying this mystery refers to Christ church this whole one flesh thing refers to Christ the church and this is a great mystery because God has etched the central drama of the gospel into human flesh a gospel in which Christ gives himself for his bride the church is seen as a man gives himself and a woman gives herself in love and commitment for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer. I will love you. And he's put it on display for all the world to see. Don't ever look at a married couple. A couple joining God is joined together again. And I hear people say, we've got to have the gospel preached at our wedding because we've got all these non-Christians coming along, so we've got to preach the gospel as if it's somehow disconnected from what's going on here. And we giggle our way through these solemn vows. What is happening here is in flesh we put the gospel on display to the world. And in many ways, friends, a couple, anyone going to be celebrating their golden wedding soon here that in a way puts the gospel on display more even than this because that a a golden wedding is about promises kept it's about promises made and the picture of the gospel that that marriage provides us is this faithful commitment and so that means for us this passion this ache we feel 
It means that we're like him. It's good to, we can talk about it. It's a blessed and holy fire that he's given us. But because his love is always faithful, so ours is, and we bind ourselves to one another in the gift of marriage because this is God's gift for how his love is shown. And you know, friends, all of human history will find its consummation in the marriage supper of the Lamb. Have you thought about that? Revelation 19, 7. At the end of time, we read, we will, Revelation 9, rejoice and be glad and give him glory. Why? For the wedding of the Lamb has come. And his bride, the church, has made herself ready. And this couple stumbling over their promises... In their flesh, they're pointing to the end of human history when a Savior comes for his bride who has made herself ready for him. Passionate, faithful. Next slide. And then thirdly, fruitful. God's love is fruitful. It, his love calls for more, more goodness, more beauty more image bearers. You see this in the creation narratives with each breaking day of those wonderful first verses of Scripture, the voice of God calls into his creation more, more, until out of the dust of the ground he makes human in his own image and says, more, God blessed them, male and female, and said, be fruitful and increase in number. And so what does it mean to bear the image of God in our bodies? Sexually, it means because his love is tender and passionate and intimate, we're, we're wired to love one another in this way. It means because his love is also covenantal and faithful, our passions must be ordered and grounded in the gift of marriage, for better, for worse. It means that because his love is fruitful, so in the gift of marriage, we enter into a one flesh union which is intrinsically ordered toward the gift of children. That is how we were designed. That is how we are being restored. And that is the story we must tell and, and friends, this is a, a culture that understands identity. Well, now it's our turn to say this is our identity. This is who we are. Do you know the earliest martyrs, one of the phrases that came to be coined in early martyrdom was, we must be what we are, Christians. And they went to their deaths for what they are. Well, today it's our turn to say, and we don't want to get a martyrdom complex, goodness me. But, but when it comes knocking at our door, hard power, we have to be ready to say, and this is who we are, image bearers, Christians. It's how we live. Now, I know you'll be buzzing with all kinds of questions. What ifs? Not sure about that. Well, what about? And we've got a question and answer session tomorrow in one of if you'd like to come along, ask all the questions, a whole hour, nothing else. But briefly, yes, there are some hard questions here, aren't there? And I just want to recognize them. Our world is a very different world to the garden paradise, which pictures God's intentions for his creation in Genesis 1 to 3. In the terrible consequences of the fall, you shall be as gods. And we took and we ate and we thought we got to say the rules, good and evil. We would know that if we, we are in charge, you see. And the terrible, devastating consequences of what Christians understand to define our reality, creation, and then fall. The image of God became marred and spoiled. We are what Francis Schaeffer called glorious ruins. 
And so in a fallen, dissolved world, even as God, who came after us, begins his work of restoration and renovation, it's not easy, is it, friends, to live in harmony with our design? Anybody finding it easy? It's why we have a cross at the center of our faith. It's hard. And today our loves, our marriages, our sex lives, like all of creation, are subject to frustration, Roman 8, are being held back, quote, unquote, by the groans of the fall. Marriages come under strain, and I know as I've been speaking, I've touched on raw, raw nerves here. And sex is often a disappointment. It's not all it's cracked up to be. And not all marriages can be fruitful and have children. And some of you feel the pain of that as I said it, didn't you? And also in today's world, as Jesus said, as Jesus said himself, a single man, not all can or should be married. This is the, the changed circumstances of the fall. For some, it, it, it doesn't work out. Others, because of, of same-sex desire. My pastor, Ed Shaw, shares in his book, his journey, little boy, same-sex desire, he didn't choose, he was pulled. That's a struggle, isn't it? The struggle to live in harmony with our design again in this fallen world. And for others, pain in the sphere of being gendered, in gender dysphoria. It's tough. And given the circumstances of the fall, many take a decision to forego this way of life, marriage, as blessed as it is, as did Paul, as did Jesus, for the joy of undistracted service to the gospel. So all kinds of ifs and, and buts around that vision. But look, friends, whatever our position here this afternoon what is clear in Matthew 19 is whatever our situation, we are all called in our different ways. Wherever we are, single, married, whatever, we're all called in our different ways to say yes to God's call, his intention, the thing to which marriage points. We're all called to say yes to that thing which is the wedding of the bridegroom and the bride. And so if you're here and you're married and you've got a secretary, and she's so nice, and she's listening to you in a way that your wife seems to have stopped a long time ago, and you are leaning close to her. Friend, in your no to that because of the promises you made, and your no to that because you say, he was faithful to me, and I will be faithful to him, and I'll be faithful to her, my wife. In your saying no to the secretary, you say yes to the thing to which marriage points, which is the faithfulness of God. And if you're a single person, you can have a one-night stand. You can get the app. There are people out there. And there are, there are all kinds of hard and painful situations. Friend, I just want to say, in your no to that, in your flesh, in your body, you're, you're not stopping being sexual because you're single. With your chasteness, with your no, you say yes to the thing to which marriage points, which is the faithfulness of God and the goodness of God. And so we all have a stake in supporting marriage as a symbol, as a pointer to the gospel itself. And that's our story. And now it's our turn to stand up and and be counted but of course the problem is well how how do I get how do I get started I, my mouth I sound like a bigot how do I do that I want to suggest four words that would help frame our response I'm going to try and speed up to get in this last section you've been so patient thank you Four words that help frame our... They're not, we don't have to use these words, but these words should change our psychological posture to this revolution, this story around us. You know, you can hide from it, become Amish. You can, you can get out there and fight it and get the lawyers out. You can, you can cave into it. 
or you can engage with it and enter into it. And there are four words help us do that, and they're coming now. Sorry, thank you, please, and never. Sorry. Sorry. We have been shame-filled times in our churches. We have avoided the tough questions. We're sorry about that. We're sorry we offered big. Life for the world, we said. I've come that you may have life, but we never talked about sex. And this is such an important part of us, and we're sorry for that. And we're sorry that sometimes we have been hypocritical, and we've liked having seminars about the gays and the transgender out there. And we give ourselves get out of jail free cards on pornography and divorce in here. And we're focused on them when we should be focusing on us. Do you notice how little we've said so far about the hot button issues? That's because this revolution isn't only about the hot button issues, it's about all of us and how we think of ourselves. And so we need to say we're sorry because some of us are bigoted. And we do disproportionately amplify this sin over others. I don't feel that in my heart, friends, but when somebody brings me an email, an LGBT person brings me an email and I read it and I, and I, I say, the person who wrote you that, they say they're a Christian? Well, I want to say I'm sorry for that because I'm a Christian and this is not the way of Christ so we're sorry and thank you thank you for not letting us to brush this under the carpet because that's our default hoping it'll go away thank you for keeping bringing it back thank you for calling out some of our hypocrisy and some of our bigotry thank you thank you for making us go back to our Bibles and scratch our heads and say what do we believe And you see, that's sorry and thank you. People often don't like me saying this. People come up and they say, it seems weak. No, no, it's strong, friends. It's the way of Christ. Before you go picking out a speck in your brother's, make sure there's no plank in your own. This is sorry, thank you. This is the way of Christ. It's the right thing to do. It's also the smart thing to do. Why? Because it disarms the narrative. The narrative... The story we live in casts you as the villain. You know what the pantomime, the curtains go back, the villains come on. You don't need to be told, we all boo him. Well, when you come on, you get booed because you're the bigger. Everybody, that is the default assumption about who you are. And if we, if we come with a different attitude, we disarm that narrative. Because people like you don't say sorry, and you don't say thank you, you're too busy protecting your own rights. No, we do, we want to say sorry. And people like you don't listen. And no, we do want to listen. Let's have a conversation. You see? Smart. But then, thirdly, please, having owned up some of our broken promises, we need to begin to share with this culture. Can we have a conversation together about some of yours? Can we get to the truth of things? Can we have a discussion about some of the facts? You promised... You made big promises. You promised freedom. Now, how's that project going? How's expressive individualism? What are the fruits in our society? Are people freer? Friends, this is, this is a scam. It is snake oil. There's no evidence that any of the mental health issues related to identity are on the decrease? How is expressive individualism doing in our culture when we see headlines like this, just from last week's Guardian? I'm not saying that expressive individualism is causing this. All I'm saying, I'm too careful a scientist for that. But what I am saying is it's doing nothing to stem it. People are struggling as the... As the popular philosopher Matthew Crawford says, this culture consigns us to a treadmill of endless, ultimately groundless self-making. I'd love to talk more about 
about how the psychological evidence is stacking up to show that just telling ourselves we're special leaves us feeling emptier than ever because it's just your own propaganda. Can we have a story about that? Can we have a conversation about that? Because you see, in our story slide, freedom comes by way of self-sacrifice, not self-fulfillment. That, we believe, is the way to life. If you've been to our churches and see some of the people pouring themselves out for others, and they'll tell you the experience of that is, is blessing, shalom. And we've got a long way to go, but, but freedom, we need to have a bigger conversation about that. And then flourishing. Flourishing is realizing your potential. It's realizing the potential of a thing. How's that project going? Well, one of the areas, at least you'd think, would be flourishing would be people's sex lives. This was about liberation, wasn't it? Well, how's that project been going these past few decades? Are people having more sex, better sex? Look at the data. You get everything at an Elam conference, you see. <laughs> this is the number, the average number of times that people have had sex in the past month. This is a very good study, a series of studies called Natsal, which I unpack more in my book if you want to go and look at some of the data behind this. But you can see, and sadly the, in the way the, the slides have been brought over into this, that it's missing the years. But um, in 2006, I think the blue one is, the average was five. You all want to know how many, aren't you? And it's not there for some reason. It's been missed off. It's five times a week, month. A month. <laughs> month. In 2010, it's four times a month. Same in men and women. Women on the right, men on the left. Doesn't matter, it's the same. 2014 three times a month. Why, says the statistician looking at these data from the University of Cambridge in his book, Sex by Numbers. Why, if we extrapolate that graph, no one will be having any sex at all by the year 2040. <laughs> now, of course, he's a statistician, so you never do that. And I doubt very much that that'll be the case. But isn't it odd that a revolution that promised more delivers less. And is the quality of people's sex lives any better? We don't have time to talk about that. But it's so interesting that, that I'm reminded of that definition of idols. Idols are things that offer more and more, but deliver less and less, until in the end they have everything. You have nothing. And do you see what this revolution is doing to the human spirit made in the image of God? offers them freedom and leads us into captivity. This isn't flourishing. Well, in our story slide, flourishing comes from living in harmony with our design, with who we truly are. It's about authenticity. It's about being real. And this is our reality. And yes, it's a struggle. And it's a slow, but in our communities, we seek to build marriages which anchor families, which bring life to the world. Fairness. This is a revolution that promised fairness. And it has delivered rights to, 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 to many sections of the adult world. But what about our kids? Because fairness, you need to think about fairness on a much broader canvas than adult rights. What about adult duties? What about adult duties to the most vulnerable of all, slide, to our children? Friends, the reality, the story we live in is that in 2013, nearly half of children were born outside of wedlock. Divorce isn't so much a disaster for kids in terms of the, sh the numbers, it's cohabitation that is so unstable. 
In some parts of inner Belfast, the poorest areas, it's two-thirds are born outside of wedlock. And most of these kids are brought up in fatherless wastelands. By the age of 16 in 2014, only one half of children reach the age of 16 with both parents living in the home. This breaks God's heart, friends. Because we're so used to it, it rolls off the tongue. But this instability torpedoes a child's security and ability to make their way in the world. And that is why it is God's plan for the life of the world that a man and a woman join themselves faithfully to one another to provide the children he loves with stability. And so, yes, we need to have a conversation about fairness, but in our story, and with this I finish, next slide, fairness is about our duties towards others, especially our kids, as well as about rights for myself. So please, can we have that conversation? Please, can we look at some of the facts together? Because you see, in the end, let's go to the last slide. We will never, never give it up. Sorry, we want to say thank you, but please, having had, we will never give this up because it's been entrusted to us. And now it's our turn to stand up and for what we believe. And don't, don't let anybody try to convince you, friend, that, that the sexual revolution is coming to us and simply asking us to make a few changes at the margins. What is at stake here is two different stories of reality. What is at stake is two different gospels with two fundamentally different stories of freedom, two rival kingdoms, two different world views. That is what is at stake. And it's our time now to hold our nerve and not just say this, this truth of, of what it means to, to be made sexual in the image of God, but to once again incarnate, to live it in our communities so that we don't just speak it, we don't just tell it, but, but we show how it brings, in the long run, life for the world. That is our task. Can I just pray with us just for one moment? Thank you so much, Lord, as we... So much to think about. Thank you that you've blessed us with the gospel. You didn't leave us stranded at sea. You dived in and you rescued us. And thank you that you call us now to stand on, on firm ground and to live the life you call us to. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.